Welcome everyone to the Yaz and Muhammad podcast where my guest today is Sarah. Sarah grew up in Iran under the Islamic regime and she is now living in Canada with the love of her life um, and she's here to tell us her story. Um, Sarah, thank you so much for joining me here today. Thank you for having me. Um, so we tried to have this conversation before and I had a terrible internet connection, but you did say something to me that I wanted to delve a little deeper about. Um, and that's when you were talking about growing up in Iran, it was really difficult for you to have a, self, a sense of, of personal identity. Now, I know this is something that a lot of women raised in Muslim majority countries or in, in Muslim communities around the world are gonna relate to to a certain extent. I mean, the fact that you were living under the Islamic regime means that you were gonna have an experience that like far extends beyond, you know, what my experience would have been being born and raised in Canada, for example. So the way Aliyah um, puts it, Aliyah is a friend of mine and one of my forgotten feminists who actually the very first forgotten feminist who's with us here today. The way she puts it is sure we were in a, like Sharia was in our home. We were under the, our home was like the Sharia um, enclave. But for you, Sharia was the entire country. Yeah. Um, so we had an escape. She grew up in America. I grew up in Canada. Outside of our doors, there was a little bit of reprieve that you wouldn't have gotten. But we still relate to that sense of not knowing who we are not ever having a chance to develop who we are as human beings, as individuals. Um, and I think that has a lot to do with being brought up in a, in a cult, first of all, that demands that you conform, but it's also because we're women. And as women, and even as young girls, being put in hijab makes us all look uniform, identical. And our thinking has to be identical as well. Um, so I want to hear your thoughts about that, like your struggle with, because you even talked about you didn't even know the texture of your own hair. Like you did not know yourself in yeah. the least. Yeah. Um, so, so talk to me a little bit about that, please. So starting from the hair thing, I've said that before, a million different times, because this is to me a metaphor for everything. I lived in Iran for 27, 28 years. And then I went to Dubai and I had a haircut and they started doing my hair. And I came out and I looked at myself and I looked at them in the mirror and I thought, that's lovely. I love that hair. I wish I could do that every day. And then I washed my hair and it came out the same way. Mm -hmm. I'm like, but I'm not doing anything. I'm, I don't have it. I, like, I'm not spending time. I'm very lazy when it comes to my hair. And then the next day it was the same and it's really humid in Dubai. So for me, I thought maybe it's the humidity, it's what, what is happening. And then I talked to somebody about it and it dawned on me that, no, I, I actually have really beautiful curly hair and I'm 28 years old and I don't know what my hair looks like. And I started Googling, how do you take care of curly hair? Like what do you put in to change it and to make it last longer and how often do you wash it? I'm like, to 28 years in Iran, I, I, I have this mentality that my hair sucks. And that's that includes everything. I suck. I don't know who I am. I don't know what I want. I want so many different things that are not acceptable to women. I want to be free and I'm not allowed. And I always feel like an outsider. I never fit. I never belong. My hair is disgusting because it's always covered under this hijab. And I'm working 12 hours every day or I'm studying and working 12 hours every day. And then I go home and I'm writing my thesis. So I don't have time to take care of myself. Maybe if I'm just a little bit more careful and pay more attention, I can have better hair. But in reality, it's not my hair's fault. You're, you're just going to brush it, put it in a bun and put it under hijab anyway. So you never take the time to Why care you? for your body. Yeah, because Why it doesn't matter. I remember when I took off... When I took off my hijab, I was explaining to one of my friends like that I had to like learn how to like move my head in the wind or whatever. Like I just was so, and she said, I remember reading 
uh, a short story from a trans woman that was saying the same thing. Like she didn't know how to like move and how her hair was going to move in the wind. And I was like, oh my God, it was like, I was becoming myself. Like I was something else before and I'm like transitioning into Yasmin, exactly. you know? That's that, like, I've been out of Iran for 13 years. I haven't been back for 10 years. And I started not going back because I was lazy. I didn't have enough money. I had just immigrated. Like there are a lot of excuses. But then after 10 years, after Gina's death, I realized I'm just being stubborn because I don't want to give up the street. I don't want to go back in and change and submit again and cover everything and become who they want me to be. Because I like who I am. I like how, like, it's 13 years now, Yasmin. And sometimes I walk down the street and it's windy and I feel like, I forgot something. I I, mm. what, what, I forgot. And then I realized, no, I didn't forget my hijab. I don't have to mm. wear it anymore. I'm in Canada. It's I'm safe. Like mm. I'm walking down the street and I see my reflection in a window and I feel like, what? Oh, oh no, it's okay. It's okay. You're safe. It's okay. You're safe. It's okay. It's breathe. You're fine. Nobody's going to kick you. Nobody's going to hit you. Nobody's going to kill you. You're not doing anything wrong. You have permission. And that includes every like I can't wear color black I had to wear black for so long during my education all the years I've been working I started teaching when I was 19 and I remember wearing a pink manteau this is like the dress that we wear on top mm -hmm. of everything else and I was asked to go into the morality section of this place I was working for to explain why I'm wearing pink why is my headscarf <sighs> pink why do I have a pink rosary around my neck like I had to explain to them why and they said you are a Buddhist because you have these this rosary I'm like do you understand that Muslims use rosaries I'm like what is wrong with you people so that feeling of not feeling safe I don't have any black dresses I cannot wear black and not hyperventilate and have a panic attack yeah, yeah. so that sense of self that you're talking about living in a cult the news came out a couple of months ago like last year that Belgium had a new election and they had two MPs that were Iranian and half Iranian half living in Belgium or Belgium and I thought one of them was in her 20s very young beautiful beautiful woman and I sat there thinking what would I be what yeah. would my life be what like? Could I, I have been? Yeah. And I cried. Like I cried for that person who could have been mm -hmm. happy and have who could have lived a life that was not all about surviving and not dying and not being half and not proving that I'm worthy. Because again, in Iran, I'm half my brother. My dad mm -hmm. could kill me and he could not be punished. And you grow up learning all these things very, very early. Like that sense of self that you're not worth anything because your father could kill you and he would just say well she disgraced me well she didn't believe in islam well she was an infidel she had a boyfriend mm -hmm. and he would go free yeah. and you hear stories like that every day that this 18 year old got murdered by her husband last monday she was married to this guy for six years she had an 18 month old baby and he killed her, hanged her and then stabbed her to death. And I heard about it two days ago and I'm sitting there thinking, what would happen to the husband? Probably nothing. They would forgive him. The way they forgave the guy who beheaded his wife and carried her, her head around the city with, her, with the knife in his hand. He got eight years, eight years, for beheading the woman who was also his cousin. Yeah, who was she's married 17 to, years old. And she had married this guy or she was forced into marrying this guy when she was 13. Mm -hmm. And they mm -hmm. had a three-year-old child and she had talked about domestic abuse and she had tried to run away and they had brought her back in and he just beheaded her and carried her head around the, the town. And he's, he's got this maniacal smile on his face and I'm, I'm like, <sighs> And he got eight years in prison and he'll be out in three. Okay, and that's the, that's what we were talking about be, before we came online was, is, you know, the curse of like, we can't, 
like, how do I put this? Even to fight for our individuality, not forget individuality, even to fight for our, you know, to not be abused, you know what I mean? Is so demonized that we're killed for it. We're killed for saying, I don't want to be abused by this man anymore. And killed in such a vicious manner to make sure that it's a message to every girl and every woman watching and listening. You're and made an example of. Pay attention. Yeah. Exactly. You're all made an example of. So whether it's you're not wearing your hijab properly, whether it's you, you know, you had a boyfriend that your father didn't approve of. Whether your you know, husband wanted didn't want you to wear jeans anymore and you wanted to wear jeans, it doesn't matter what the infraction is. It could be the tiniest, stupidest thing, but it's irrelevant. It's the I'm point coming. of it's control. He wants to control you and you think you have the right to stand up on your own two feet. That's interesting because I got a death threat for coming on this podcast. You block oh God, this guy. Sarah. He's on Twitter, and I don't know. He's the guy who told me to call. Yeah, like he's the guy who called me a prostitute and the slut, and and then said, "Change your name to." And then you have you have an OnlyFans, or you're selling feet pictures and stuff like that. And my husband saw that, and he's laughing. He's like, "You're selling your feet picture." <laughs> like I, I'm going to start that. But then he, I, I saw his message on Twitter yesterday that you're a traitor, and traitors should be put down or should be killed or something. Mm. And this is not hypothetical. Like if he knows where I live, this is not just him saying something, trying to rile me up. He actually mm -hmm. wants me to die and he would actually kill me if he knows where I am and who I am. And I'm living yeah, not in just a him. country. Like I'm, mm -hmm. I'm saying, this is my freedom of expression, my freedom of religion mm -hmm. that I'm trying to exercise now. And they don't want to see that. I'm coming on a podcast. He doesn't know what I'm talking about. He doesn't know what I'm going to say. Maybe I'm just going to complain about my personal life and my abusive husband and we are done. But he wants me dead. Yeah. I'm like, yeah. okay, but what do I do with this? It's just another yeah. piece of useless information that I'll carry around because he's not the only one. He's unfortunately not the only one. And like you said, it's not an empty threat either. I mean, you come from a country where you saw women being attacked with acid. Just in Egypt, a young girl was killed at her university because she refused the advances of one of her classmates. I mean, the stories are endless, right? Yeah. But they just feel like they have to have complete control over women as if we are a thing to be owned by them. And if we dare to act in any other way, then just killing us is the answer. That's why honor violence is so prevalent. Yep. Honor killings are so prevalent. And what do they do with these honor killings? As you mentioned, they support each other. Yep. The men don't get... They, they're not getting prosecuted for these. They're not getting life in prison. They're not getting, you know, Iran executes people over the, the stupidest things, drinking alcohol, you know, being homosexual, just living your life. But if you want to cut off the head of your wife or cut off the head of your daughter, you're going to get a few years at best because you're protecting the family's honor. If you do, sometimes it's like that was... That was acceptable and understandable because we are Muslims. And this is what God said we should do to kafar or people who bring dishonor to us. So why would you destroy a man's life? Because he killed mm. this 12 year old or 14 year old. Well, he had every right to protect his honor. And you sit there and you think, how do I explain to these people that this is not right? It's not about even being misogynistic or not. It's not about, I don't know, having the right to breathe or it's about very clear facts. It's not okay to murder somebody. I mean, do you, does anybody need to be told that? Does a father I, need to be told, do not kill your daughter? You know what I mean? Like this, this is the, this is where the bar is now. <laughs> this is the conversations that we need to have, right? Please don't mutilate your daughter's genitals with a razor blade. Please don't kill your daughter. Don't behead her, you know? 
these are th this is where the this is this is where the education has to start it's absolutely insane like we, when you think of it that way you start to think it, it, it's it's demoralizing you know you feel like the the road is so long the mountain is so high if that's our starting point right now they, you really think that they don't get it you think that they don't know but how do you educate like I read a piece of news yesterday, two days ago. I was Googling the number of, like, when the news came out about this young lady who was murdered by her husband. I just looked up how many child brides we had. And it's something around 131,000 girls under the age of 15 have been married in the past five years. And, and that's in Iran that. alone. That's in Iran alone. We had around 800 women from between the ages of 10 and 14, given birth in the first six oh. months of the year. 800 women, women, and I'm mm. using that word intentionally, between the ages of 10 and 14 gave birth. I'm like, oh but, but how, how is that even, like, how is that, po is it possible biologically? I've never given birth, I don't know. But thinking about when I was 10 years old and I was trying to figure out why I'm going to hell for not wanting to wear my headscarf and my brother still gets five extra years ahead of me, six extra years ahead of me, and he has all this time to try and pick and choose what he wants to do and exercise his freedom and have fun and then be responsible. I'm thinking I was stuck in that phase when I was 10 years old. But this person is married off has to have mm -hmm. has to have sex and then have has to give birth after nine months of carrying this child in your body. Like, but why? Well, that's my that's what my second question to you was about the fact that they get us married off so young. The fact that having a girl get married so young, like why it's so important to them. Happened to me, happened to Aaliyah, happened to so many people that grew up in Muslim majority countries and Muslim majority communities around the world. So think about that for a moment. Why would it be important for, for them to make girls get married so young and to start having babies at such a young age, even though it could kill them? Why do you think they do that? I think it's a power play, it's subjugation you learn to submit from a very young age. They break your spirit. They don't give you any choice. They, they tell you that this is, the, like I'm 41 years old now. And yay for me to have survived because I thought I would not reach the 30. Mm -hmm. And when I got to my 40th last year, I got myself another tattoo because I survived. And I, I anytime I survive something really traumatic or huge, I get a tattoo. It's like, a battle scar I remember mm. so I look at my rabbit and I real I, I remembered I'm still alive I'm still here despite everything despite myself because I did not help the situation but going back to your question I think I'm 41 years old I talk to my grandma twice a year every single time we talk we get into a fight why are you not having babies it's now getting mm. too late you're losing that time. Like, what? why? Why are you don't understand what joy it brings you? You don't understand how. And I'm like, you do not know what I went through. You do not know how I'm trying to put myself back together bit by bit. That's the most selfish thing to do right now to break my own body, to give birth to somebody that I don't want, to prove something to the rest of the world. But her mentality, she had, she has four daughters. One of them is my mom. My mom was the only one who finished her high school education and got married at the age of 21 to somebody she chose. My three aunts were married off before they were 15. They gave birth before they were 15. Wow. And these are intelligent women. These are women who spend all their lives trying to survive different atrocities and trying to survive a society that did not see them as women and as human. Mm -hmm. So I'm looking at them and I'm thinking, I don't want to have children just to prove something to you. And I'm still fighting with my own mom about this. She knows what I've been through. She still wants me to, to have children to prove to her that motherhood is the greatest thing that could ever happen to women. And I think, mm -hmm. but why? But what's the point? 
I have two cats. I'm happy. <laughs> For the first time in my life, I'm happy. Well, it's and sad because, the- Sarah, you have so many other things in your life to make you happy. But these women were born with the, you know, uh, with the indoctrination that their only purpose on this planet is to be a wife and to be a mother. That's that's what, you know, that's how they are valued. You are only valued as a good wife, as a good subservient, obedient wife, and as a mother. You know, you have to make babies. And you have um, to make they can't babies. see. Sorry. May, you have to make male babies. Like you have to you have, have to sons. Male babies. Yeah, yeah. Girls are and they just... Work. They can't see the, the the value of themselves even other than in those roles. And so it's really hard for them to imagine that you can actually be happy and fulfilled <laughs> without those things. Yeah. Every every definition of woman in Iran. Yeah. I'm defying, I'm not going back to visit my parents. I'm not caring enough I don't have children I got divorced when it was not the norm to get divorced I immigrated to two two different countries because I could not survive in my own country I don't want to cover up I don't want to be decent and quiet I'm loud and shrill and I don't know I'm a harlot that's basically (laughs) it he got this one right I'm a harlot I'm happy I claim this I've worked really hard to come here and be here and exist as a harlot and not to have to cover up or worry about it. But a lot of girls in Iran don't, are not, that's the point. If I was married off at 16, if my Mm -hmm. dad had been the mean to marrying somebody else, I wouldn't Mm -hmm. be this loud, problematic. You would still be her. You would be her, but it would have taken you longer to get there. This Sarah would have come out. Your authentic self would be. It would have taken longer. Because I I can say this because I've spoken to so many women. Sarah, another Sarah, just like you on this call, um, had the most atrocious childhood. You have to watch her Forgotten Feminist episode. Um, just beyond anything you could possibly imagine. Orphaned, she was a refugee, she was illiterate, she suffered FGM, she suffered all sorts of abuse. She was, it was just, I mean, the list goes on and on and on. But her true self, that what you're calling a harlot, you know, that, that fire that was in you. Yeah. They tried so hard to mute it. I mean, the Islamic Republic of Iran was not even successful in putting out that fire in putting out your flame. You know, your father wouldn't have been successful either. And whatever man they would have married you off to wouldn't have been successful either. You would still be you. But it is an absolute fucking atrocity that breaks my heart that we have to fight so hard to be who we are. I should it's like have you to said at the beginning. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. It's like you said at the beginning of this conversation. Imagine what I could have been. Imagine yeah. if that young Sarah was nurtured and loved and protected from the beginning. That you didn't have to feel, I don't belong in this place. You were, you were saying that you felt like Alice in Wonderland where nothing around you made sense. You know, you just constantly felt like a fish out of water. You, why did you have to go through all that? You know what I mean? People look at us now and they say, oh, you're so brave. Oh, you survived. Oh, your trauma made you stronger. No, it didn't. That is so, no, it didn't. It It almost killed me. Yeah. (laughs) And I still fight it every day, you know? And I resent it. I resent having Mm. to be strong. I resent, Mm -hmm. I, I always say, I do not miss people anymore. I'm sorry, my cat just made an appearance and she might just knock everything off. And I apologize, it's right in the (laughs) middle of the whole conversation. But I always say, I don't miss anybody. Like I trained myself very early on not to miss my parents, not to miss my brother when he was in Iran, not to miss my friends that I lost contact with. Like I trained myself because it was heartbreaking to have to just pack up and leave and be halfway around the world and not be able to see them anymore. 
So I've trained mm-hmm. myself and I don't miss the, I love spending time with friends. I love spending time with my parents when they come here sometimes. And I love meeting people that are kindred spirits, but I do not miss people. I miss the woman I could have been though. Oh, yeah. I miss, like I sit there, you, t- you tell me that I would have survived and I would have come out anyway, but I keep thinking, what would I be if I was given the chance, mm-hmm. if I did not have to survive, if I was allowed to be who I wanted to be right from the start, what would my life be like? Like, what could I achieve? What would life be, life be like if I was not heartbroken? If I did not have severe anxiety, if I did not have PTSD. So I'm sorry. Hi, everyone. This is Austin. And she is the center of attention everywhere she goes. So I apologize. She doesn't understand. No, I'm sorry. It's just comic oh, relief. Good. I'm sorry. <laughs> I got like, some I keep... Austin booty. We're good. Yeah, I'm so sorry. <laughs> Bronte cannot get on the table. So we are lucky. <laughs> I keep thinking, what would my life be like if when I told my mom again and again and again that I wanted a divorce Mm -hmm. and she would say okay why okay let's go get a divorce and not tell me well when you go to Canada do that don't do it here Mm -hmm. and never ask me Mm -hmm. never asking me what but you love this person why why do you want a divorce why do you keep talking about getting a divorce why is this your fantasy now you love this person you are you said you wanted to marry him you fought tooth and nail to marry this person you fought the family who said no we are yeah. not going to this marriage because sarah is ugly and she's not wearing chador you got into that family extremely religious family but why do you talk about divorce no don't do it here when you get to canada do it then I think it's important to just to, to remember, though, like we talked about, you didn't even have a sense of your own self. This gender segregation that they do too makes you, you not only do you not know yourself, but you don't know men and you don't know how to pick a partner. If you don't know who you are, how are you going to know who matches with you? Right. The first like, person who quotes the little prince, I married him. I mean, that is stupid. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry, I know you said I should not use that word, but that was like, he called it the little prince and I thought, oh, I am seeing, he understands me, I'm marrying him. He's my soulmate. <laughs> yeah. And I thought, I, we will die and they'll put us in the same grave because he understands me. Yeah. Mm, like, I it doesn't never... take much. Yeah, but you didn't know. You didn't know anything. And you thought I... that, well, the fact that he was quoting a book that you were that you loved, meant that, that there life. was some sort of connection yeah. yeah but you know how were you to know you didn't even you didn't know we are not allowed to when we get together in part like we have parties in iran of course but it's illegal it's forbidden i have a long list of things that are forbidden that i would love to read for you but parties dancing music with the other gender read is it forbidden. read it to me get me your list what are the things it's- that are forbidden <laughs> This is very random, people. I'm sorry. Chicken cuts and marinated chicken. Wait, what? <laughs> These we are can't things. go any further. No, and, we have to stop at number one. <laughs> there are like there are news articles. Like if you are inclined to do your research, you can try that. I'm not sure if it's in English, but there are news articles in Persian. Or there are people who have been arrested and there are arrest records for these things. So chicken cuts and chicken marinated, not legal. Water games of any sort, fire games, like jumping over fire when we do during Charshan Basuri before the new year, mm, that's forbidden. Zoroastrianism. Mm. Yes. Watching soccer at the movie theater, women cannot go to the stadium. So they thought mm. maybe we could just go to the movie theater and have this collective experience. They cannot do that at the movie theater either. Bike riding for women, of course. Yeah. Swimming in open bike water. riding because if we ride a bike, we might lose our virginity. Oh my That's god! That's what the reason is. Yeah. How would humanity survive without? <laughs> Sorry. So, swimming I don't in know how. Water. I don't know how they ride bikes, but <laughs> I I don't know. Let's not get into it. That's really so. There was this woman who drowned in the open waters in the north of Iran, in the Caspian Sea. 
the, the lifeguards dragged her out. The husband did not allow them to resuscitate her and give her mouth to mouth or touch her. They just said, the husband said, step away. Do not touch my wife. And she died. And swimming, well. swimming in open waters, cannot, women cannot do that. Saying the word dance on TV, a reporter got banned from TV because he or she said dance. Dancing, singing, playing musical instruments for women in real life. Mm. Like I have a friend who studied music at the university and that's legal, you can do it. But you cannot also play musical instruments on TV or in video or anything else. Singing, only if you're a woman. Only if you're a woman. Singing and dancing, forbidden any situation at all. Wearing long boots, short winter jackets, hats without scarves, putting your jeans in your, in your long boots. The color white for women clothing, one specific summer, I remember you could not wear white and go out and not get arrested because we have the morality police, of course. Mixed parties, especially if you have music. Like if you have old people getting together with your grandparents and eating dinner and they leave, that's okay. But if you have a bunch of adults like cousins or brothers and sisters and even friends, married people get together and they wanna have a party together and have music, that's forbidden. You could get arrested for that. Uh, VCRs and VCR players were forbidden at one point. Satellite dishes were forbidden right after VCR was allowed and okay. So they just mm, went up another. So they could come to your house and collect all the satellite dishes and we all had to cover them because of course we had them. Valentine's Day, keeping and buying grapes, also grape juice. People make I alcohol. have so many questions. Oh. oh, my dad makes alcohol. Oh my my right. first husband used to make alcohol. You can make yeah. vodka from potatoes, though. Like, you'll figure it out. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> watermelon. My dad used watermelon. Yeah. Like, like, that's a, but Oranges. people don't know. So, yeah. of course, alcohol of any kind, if it's medicinal, that's okay because if you drink it, you go blind. So, that's punishment enough. Mm. You can buy alcohol at pharmacies but that's medicinal it's different nail polish and highlights in your hair like if you had blonde highlights for one specific mm -hmm. summer I remember if you had a tan you would get arrested uh I remember when we were in primary school headbands under uh headscarves and matinee that was forbidden white socks <laughs> taking graduation pictures in front of Tehran University open-ended movies Importing musical instruments, condoms, of course, and the International Day of AIDS was wiped from calendars. Women cannot divorce men, that's haram. Hugging and kissing in public, even if you're siblings. Using ethnic names for your businesses, using ethnic names for your children. That's why we have Gina, Mahsa, and me, because they would not allow her ah, parents to call her Gina. Because it's, it's Kurdish. Name. So mm. that was forbidden. Now they are playing pastel loose and it depends on the, the region and where you do it. Like in Tehran might be easier, but in Kurdistan, they were still pushing it. So ice cream cones in one specific city. Barbary bread during Ramadan in another city because it was deemed as a symbol of breakfast. So it's Ramadan, you cannot have this bread for a whole month. They closed the bakeries. Bodybuilding for women. Pets, cats and dogs, especially inside the house. Backgammon. My dad had to make a backgammon board at home. And he would hide it when my grandparents showed up. Card games of any sort. And of course, gambling. Women standing behind the coffee shop counter. This is new. Come on. And then men pouring tea for women in movies and on TV. They block it out. <laughs> It's like censored. <laughs> and this is funny because I'm, I'm writing this and I'm thinking, I'm not even talking about the hijab laws. Yeah. Or marriage. Like Khomeini has this whole, um, this is like comic relief to me. But at the same time, mm. we have this specific page in his book that he, this is the supreme leader of the Shia Muslims. Who I, I have this page that I'm not going to read it, but it's like, if you Google it, getting married or having sex with infants 
Oh, and there's yeah, this I know. instructional yeah. manual that go, and yeah. whether you can even marry this infant's sister or not comes into con- and I'm sitting there thinking how do you educate these people that think having sex with an infant is okay and there's this is the the limits that you can go if you don't want to go to hell Yeah. So I, raping, I like raping because, an infant, but because yeah. there's no other way to deal. Like I'm, I'm having heart palpitations now talking about this. Mm-hmm. And I think, what well, is this something I need to talk about to you? This is something I need to tell you not to do. Like mm-hmm. how deprived are it's you? Just, I, it just if you think about it though, like the same, like raping an infant is okay, but ice cream cones are not. Are not. You know what yeah. I mean? Like, yeah. where, where? How do you even begin a conversation with a mind that fucked up? Like, where do you start? The father you know? who beheaded her daughter, her twelve-year-old daughter, Romina, because she had a boyfriend who was twenty-eight years old and she wanted to marry him. He beheaded her using a sickle. Yeah. Because there was this huge age gap, and he didn't want to do it, and she wanted to marry this. This guy is 28 years old. He's a groomer. He's a pedophile. But nobody's arresting him. Mm -hmm. Nobody's even talking about him. Yeah, even the father didn't say anything to him. He just killed his daughter. He just beheaded the daughter when she was asleep. Yeah. Um, So... You know, when you're telling me about all of these minutia, obviously there's huge things. You 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 quickly went past the fact that women can't get divorced. You know what I mean? Like these are massive issues here. Um, and there, then there's also small issues that are just so annoying. Like it, sometimes the small issues can be like a straw that breaks the camel's back. And as you're talking, I was like, well, of course, you're in a revolution. You know what I mean? Like you guys need like a French style revolution. We need like beheadings in the middle of Iran. You know what I mean? Like in the middle of of Tehran. Like this is just, this is what it feels like. It feels like this, the fact that that's not happening is a miracle that you've put this much pressure on people for over 40 years. And the fact that they haven't just revolted and started going into your palaces and into your government offices and just like mowing you all down is a miracle. Like you should be grateful. You're blessed that that hasn't happened yet. But the revolution that is happening right now, I do want to talk to you about like your thoughts on it. I know that it's made, I have a quote from you here that is really beautiful. So I'm going to read it. You said, We all know the rules of this game. This is a cycle that can only be broken with our freedom. And the first time in a decade, I want to be there in Iran. I want to be part of this revolution because this is real. Because for the first time in my life, I don't feel alone. I understand what it means to be proud of your language and of your people. I feel like I belong. It feels like the collective consciousness of a country is growing despite the pushbacks and the violence and the pain. It's like your country has embraced you, has grown. It's like your country has found its authentic self in the same way that you have. You followed the same trajectory and now you are one, you know? So tell me about your hope for for your country's future. I'm sorry. No, oh, I'm sorry. No, it's it's beautiful. Like they arrested Sepida Sepida Rational for her not covering, and she's been having a lot of issues. And then they showed her face on TV, and she was beaten, she was tortured, mm. and she was broken, and she was giving this confession against herself. And I was so scared that I started crying. And then Gina was murdered. Mm-hmm. And my husband told me about it because I was not on Twitter and I wasn't following the news for 10 years because it's heartbreaking. It's painful just to read about people trying to sell their children on the street because they're hungry 
or women being beaten to death and dying. And I'm not following this, but I'm still seeing videos and pictures and death. And there's so much misery and there's so much pain and I can't do anything about it. And I'm, all I'm thinking about is just, just surviving, just not dying, just, just being stubborn and not dying because that's, that's what the government wants. That's what the country, that's what Islam wants. Because as long as I exist, I'm just a stain on this narrative that they're trying to feed the world. So my husband said that this is what happened to her. And the first day I did not cry because I thought that's, that's not real. This is just a game. They're, this is not, they would not go that far because this would just break everything they've tried to build. The world could see it and they would not play that fast and loose. But then the second day we had more news and more pictures and women walking down corridors in the hospital with their headscarves. And I'm thinking, there, there is, I can see your hair. This is, this is a video of a woman walking down the corridor in, in the hospital and I can see your hair. And I burst into tears. Mm. And I thought, that's it, that's it, that's now. And I cried for the first hundred days after her murder because there's so many pieces of news coming out, name after name after name, children dying and people getting tortured. And it's not just one person getting hanged here or there anymore. This is like what happened in the 80s. Like hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people are dying, but they're pushing back. And we have a voice outside Iran now. Like about four or five years ago, they killed 1,500 people within three days. Mm -hmm. They cut down the internet. And you were saying it's a, it's a miracle. Well, people have come out, people have pushed back, but they've been mowed down in great numbers. Mm -hmm. And we've had the lobbyists outside Iran trying to whitewash it and to be apologists and trying yes. to just change the narrative. But this time it felt like we have a voice, we can talk about it. And we started talking about it. We started sharing ideas, we started sharing stories. We started finding each other on the internet, on Twitter, on Instagram, out on the street. We walked again and again, and it's like, I'm not alone in this anymore. People are, mm -hmm. are we are all here, we all want it. And of course there's pushback. Of course, I should not know what time the morning call to prayer is in Iran. But I know because they hang people at the morning call to prayer. And every night, every once in a while, we have this Twitter storm for this person who is in danger. And we try to find somebody to raise awareness and talk to, to, to the government on our behalf to try to stop this execution to hap from happening. But people are now more active. People are angry. Yeah. People like we have, it's not, as bad and a lot of people say oh but people have just quieted down it's it's silent there's it's not women send pictures of themselves without their hijab on the street they are pushing back men yeah. are standing with these women inside iran for the first time in my life i saw videos of girls dancing on the street and i thought i i want to know what that feels mm -hmm. i want to know what it feels to dance on the street I want to know what it feels to be free and not to be afraid. And this is not a generation that you can silence anymore. This is a generation that has access to the internet and knows other languages and talks to people in Europe and England and I don't know, Canada and the, like they connect. So mm -hmm. you can kill Sarina and Mika, but there are hundreds of thousands more out there. They started poisoning girls in school yeah, for yeah. months. This, and we still don't mm -hmm. know what kind of poison they used. Mm -hmm. And it was very quiet and nobody was reporting it, but it was horrendous. Like in one yeah. day, they poisoned 121 schools and that's just one day. And they're killing people. They are trying to, this is punishment. They are trying to silence people like they've, they have hanged more than 300 people since the beginning of 2023. We are in June. Yeah. It's not even six months. More than 300 people have been hanged. And yes, they're not all political prisoners and political protesters, but these are poor people who do not have birth certificates in Baluchistan. So they have to smuggle something across the border in order to survive and not die of hunger. Mm -hmm. these are like they say these are rapists i don't believe that they would not arrest the rapist it's just a label they put on it like they they hanged navid afkari right after 
the whole problem with the bloody November some years ago. And it's the, the, that's the thing that happens. They hang this man who was a wrestler for a crime he did not commit. And six days later, they put his brother in solitary confinement. And he's been in solitary confinement for a thousand and three days now. So it's not just him who gets hanged. It's a whole, like my uncle was in prison. He was a political prisoner when I was really, really young, like at the beginning of the revolution. When they started killing people in the 80s, he just packed his bags and one night he left with his family. I haven't seen my uncle in more than 23, 24 years. Mm. Sorry, 33, 34 years, I'm sorry. Mm. And he's a political refugee somewhere. Lives get affected, people, like it's not just my uncle who had to run away. I grew up with that story that he did not feel safe because they were like in one summer, summer of 1988, they killed up to 5,000 people. They would shoot people back then. And then they would set, send a receipt to the families of the people they executed yeah. for the bullets they used. And, when and they, they were just elected in the UN right now for human rights something. Human Rights Commission Social Forum. Two days after they executed two men for criticizing Blasphemy. social mm -hmm. media. And then two days ago, it came out that they are elected vice president to General Assembly, UN General Assembly. I'm like, is the UN mocking us at this point? Or I is don't this understand. Is this I a don't fascist? understand. Like, to me, you're supposed to be on our side. You're supposed to be mm -hmm. not a fascist organization. Mm -hmm. This, for me, it, to me, that at this point, it's like, like, what's the point then? Like, the mm -hmm. UNICEF did not say anything for the duration of this revolution. More than 70 kids were murdered on the street in Iran. The UNICEF did not raise one objection. And when people went into their offices in Tehran and said, why don't you say something? You are the UNICEF. They said, well, if I say something, they'll close off the office. Well, they close off the office, say something. But if they- That's your the job. Office, That's the purpose of the office. No, the purpose of the office is to get donations. Mm -hmm. They said, if they close off the office, where do we get the donations? So it feels we are very alone at times. Yeah. And I, I, yeah. I acknowledge, I understand what where I'm sitting and how I have the ability to talk to you about this. And there are millions of women in Iran who don't. Mm -hmm. But it feels like now I, I feel connected. I feel like when I talk about this on the internet, when I talk to strangers on Twitter, they don't tell me I'm just asking for too much. They don't tell mm -hmm. me to just be patient. They don't tell me it's mm -hmm. not an issue. Hijab is not that important. I've got so many different people who are fighting back because they understand how this is the, the cornerstone for everything. How I become half a human by just covering at the age of seven. And if, People are not giving any services to women who are not wearing hijab in Iran right now. And women are finally screaming angrily that I want my services. I want a human being. I want my respect. And for the first time, men, Iranian men are actually standing up alongside women and supporting yeah. them and defending them. There is a and video that. Yes, go ahead. Yeah, there is a, a video that, that came out recently, well, a, a while ago, actually, where there were these two young girls that were not wearing hijab at a store, and this cranky old bastard picks up some yogurt and dumps it on their heads. And then the men in the store started attacking him and pushing him out, and I was, like, screaming, like, for the first time, like, it was so beautiful to see yeah. that men were defending right I'm happy with response. yeah I know I know yeah it was it was really beautiful to see and one of the first things that we all said was like you would never see that in Saudi Arabia you'd never see that in Egypt like you know it's really <laughs> hard to imagine men standing up for women in any yeah. other one of these patriarchal misogynist Islamic societies so it is incredibly beautiful to see Iranian men do that and they get hanged for, for it women. they get yeah. severe like they know the price they are paying 
and they mm-hmm. still stand up for women because they know as long as we don't have equal rights as long as i don't have the freedom to choose what i want to do and what i want to wear and who i want to be they don't have any freedom either they are just submitting yeah. as well yeah. differently but they are submitting they have to yeah. follow the same kinds of inhumane rule and expectation that list of stupid things mm-hmm. this if if I cannot choose what I want to wear, it's just telling them, I do not see you as a human either. You're just mm-hmm. some animal that cannot control his impulses. That's disrespectful. Well, I'm and glad they get that. They get that. That's, that's yeah. lo- like El Nazar Kabi, the, the rock climber who came back, mm-hmm. she did not have her, her job. Her brother was attacked because he stood mm-hmm. up right next to her. Or Sepida Rashno, the girl that I was talking about for removing her hijab and getting tortured on TV. She did not have the support of her family. But then her brother came out to support her. And she talks about this tender, beautiful relationship that they are evolving now together and that how they are talking to each other and how he's got her back and how he tries to, to help. But also tells her, just be careful. Just, mm-hmm. just be careful. That fear. But at yeah. the same time, talks about how she's just cherishing that relationship because now she's got a brother that she never had before. I mean, that's hope. That is hope for the future that I don't think we've ever had before. No, no. Um, and, and do you feel hopeful about this revolution? Do you, do you feel hopeful that this regime will finally be annihilated? I don't ask if you're hopeful that the Western nations or that the international community (laughs) will support Iranian people because for a long time, I actually did have that hope. Yeah. No, Um, no. Don't give them money. Don't support them. No, that's what Biden is doing now. It's a terrorist regime. It's like they're trying to be friends with the Taliban in Afghanistan. It's I understand. I don't understand. Like, how are you? How are you being friends with literal terrorists? How these are terrorist regimes and you are normalizing them and and um you know legitimizing them. Because happiness and dignity and respect is a Western civilization invention wow. and they deserve it. And we are brown people, and I know I don't show, but I'm considered brown. I've been told so many times to my face that I'm not white, that it's just okay, whatever. I don't, I'm not even discussing that anymore. Mm-hmm. I'm Middle Eastern, that's enough for me. Mm-hmm. Don't take away that identity from me. So mm-hmm. to them, we are brown people who do who do not understand, not that we, are, we don't deserve, we do not understand what freedom is. We do not understand what responsibility is. We do not understand what it means to be equal and to have dignity. So they talk about, they, like they cut their hair and that's like, I love Masi for doing this. She cut her hair. Everybody cut her hair. And then she said, now that you cut your hair, now stand in solidarity. In solidarity with yeah. us. Now do, do something. something useful. Mm. Do not have a relationship with this murderous regime. And everybody says, oh, oh, no, 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 no. That's too much. That's mm. like, we want our hostages back. So we are sending this terrorist to your country and we get our hostage. We don't care about the rest of you. You can mm-hmm. do what the, like you want to have a nuclear bomb? Go ahead. Who cares? It's the next generation. They could just deal with your nuclear bombs. They do not understand the atrocities this regime is capable of. They do not understand the games they play. They, they do not, like to them, this is like another Hollywood movie and they'll come out. The yeah. They are, they are smarter and they know more. Mm-hmm. And they know that's exactly it. That's the, you're, that's, stupid you're absolutely correct. Yes. It's the arrogance, the narcissism, and the naivete for them to think that this is just them. This isn't our problem. We can we can continue to le- legitimize these or organizations, these yeah. terrorist organizations, because they're only going to hurt Iranian people or Afghani people. They're not going to hurt us. We're Who cares safe. about Afghan women? Like, let them be subjugated yeah. and murdered and enslaved yeah. and die of hunger in their houses because they don't have a man to take them shopping for food. Who cares? Let them kill each other. They do not understand the danger that these governments are. Or they don't care, Sarah. (laughs) Or they don't care. That could be both. Like they think we are stupid and we'll just kill each other off. They don't Mm -hmm. understand how this is going to take over the whole world. Mm -hmm. And because they think that they never will. 
They no. have this arrogance to think, oh no, but they're just a bunch of dumb, illiterate, soap wearing, you know, exactly. turban people. Exactly. They're never going to be able to, yeah. The so. fact that they do not understand the difference between Iran and Afghanistan and I don't know, Dubai, for example, like the number of times I've been asked if I speak Arabic mm. or if I can belly dance or but but Middle East is not in Asia. You're not Asian. Like the, the ignorance that this side of the world is dealing with is mind boggling. Like you have the Internet. Google this. It takes two minutes. It's mm. really, really like ridiculous. They still think Islam is a race. They think, yeah. they think Muslims yeah. are an yeah. ethnic group. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And I'm Islamophobic yeah. to the whole race. Exactly. So but, but going back to your question, the people mm-hmm. in Iran, a lot of major cities, this is a genie that not, that's not going to go back in. Like in mm-hmm. Tehran, it's very obvious. People are fighting. In Kurdistan, they've been fighting for decades. Baluchistan is out every Friday walking showing that they are not going to submit but then at the same time i'm like i am a pessimist and we were talking about how if things can go wrong they go wrong and nothing ever gets better at all where i come from that's a fact it's not just something that mm. we can tell you guys but there are like there is this awakening in people and at the same time we have all these different forces because there's money and power and control involved. So if this government or if this regime is toppled, there will be other people waiting to take over because there's a lot of money in that country. We have the second biggest gas reserve in the world. Yeah. That's how mm-hmm. they become elected vice president to the UN General Assembly. Somebody just said Qatar. Qatar is the first with the biggest oil reserve, gas reserve. We are the second. Gas. Biggest. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So that money that they have, that power and control that they have, Mm -hmm. and it's very difficult for people. That's the reality of it. But at the same time, we have this cultural awakening that people are not going to accept that abortion is not legal anymore. Like they created this, this database that if somebody is testing positive for a pregnancy in an office or a hospital or a clinic, their name goes into this database. So they're going to track pregnancies. So if women could have illegal abortions before, hush, hush, there is this doctor that could help you. There's this pill that could help you drink this, this whatever herbal tea. And it, you can't do that anymore because now you are recorded in this database and they will follow and track you. So this is very much like Margaret Atwood's mm-hmm. And she Which wrote was that based on Iran. Mm-hmm. Iran's events. So this is not something that's far-fetched because somebody told me, well, abortions are legal in Iran. Like, that's news to me. Like, I, I did not know that, but okay. So there are mm-hmm. a lot of people who are explaining my country to me, especially recently. So, okay, if you're Iranian, and if you're fr- from this country, and if you're a woman, and you or you have lived in country for 10 years. I'm not very picky. Raise your hands. <laughs> because uh, I did that. But no. But at the same time, people are talking about it now. People are pushing back. Women are pushing back. And they're not going to just sit there silently and not just want their equal rights. So my hope is, yes, eventually people will have the power and we'll have the awakening. But at the same time, I know how brutal this regime is. I know mm-hmm. how they kill everybody. And it's not just them who are killed, it's the families getting affected as we discussed. Their friends who are like Navid Afkari, who I was talking about, who was hanged and his brother has been in solitary confinement and his sister is under house arrest and the other brother is also in, in prison. His best friend was disappeared right after his death. And they found his bones last summer in a mountain. So it's not just that person. They try to just remove everything and everybody associated with you to create that fear. And they are successful. I'm scared. I mean, I I hope they won't be successful for much longer. They have been successful to this point. 
but, but I, I agree with you that things are different now. This generation is different. The internet generation of, of kids, like it's, it's a, it's a different world for them. They can't brainwash them as easily as they could up to Gen X, you know, when we yeah. didn't yeah. have yeah. any other, they could ban the books. You were talking about the boxes of books that were in your basements that were all banned. They yeah. can ban movies. They could ban VCRs. They can ban um, satellite dishes. It was easier for them to control the societies. Than, and they than it still is now. like th that's the thing. I'm scared, but I'm really, really angry. And I want revenge. We were talking about this, and I just said something. I'm not joking. I want revenge at this point. I don't want justice. I don't want fairness and equality. And I want revenge right now. I'm so angry at this point that. I like you. You asked me if I wanted to have this on video or if it's it's okay. If I don't want to show up because you understand how dangerous it could be for me and my parents and my friends and anybody associated with me to come on your podcast and say all these things and talk about how Islam is just misogynistic and problematic and brutal and not the right way of thinking. We all know the dangers. But I talked to my husband and he's the rational one. And he said, well, why not? You're not going back. And I said, well, I, I, I understand the dangers because I'm putting you in danger as well. Like I had to talk to him about this and I'm a feminist and I don't talk to him about any, but that was a point that I thought this is going to affect you as well. It could affect mm -hmm. your family as well because this is danger. I'm, and I'm, not, I'm a nobody. Like they're not gonna track me down and try to do anything, but we have that fear at this point that something could happen. They could just decide that this is the person that we want to target to make an example of. Why not? Let's do it. And at this point, I'm like, I, I don't care anymore. Bring mm -hmm. it, bring it. Yeah. Let's see what you wanna do. I've got death threats already. I'm not, I'm not scared I'm, for myself. I'm scared for my family. I'm scared for my friends. But at this point, how long do you want to live in fear mm. and subjugation? I've been defying you in silence for my whole life. And you've made my life a living hell. Like I, I've got PTSD. I've got severe anxiety. I have to talk to a therapist in order to be able to function as a normal human, whatever that means. And, and she says, I am in awe of how you function every day. She said that, like, do you want to go on medication? I'm like, I, I tried, it doesn't work. So let's try. And she said, I'm in awe how you function. I don't know how you function so well. With, like, it's severe anxiety. I have notes for coming to talk to you. Because I want to take care of, like, I feel responsible for these names. I res feel responsible for these people. And I have a voice. You're giving me a voice. So I feel like you are seeing me. You are allowing me to exist and feel safe. And it's, for me, this is a therapy session as well. Because I'm pouring out everything. And I'm hoping that people would take just a little bit with this with themselves, and then they see somebody, a Muslim person who's pushing back, especially in Canada now that we have the Office of Islamophobia. I'm still waiting for the Office of Islamo Trauma, by the way. I'm still waiting for Justin Trudeau to announce that he is thinking about me as well as mm. a Canadian citizen. Mm -hmm. Keep waiting. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I know. But... No, I, I absolutely do see you. I, I hear you and I feel you because I went through a similar thing as well where, um, you know, I've known, Ayan Hirsi is on the Al-Qaeda hit list and she's somebody who I admire um, deeply. And she's somebody who I knew personally before I came out publicly. And I knew that she has to live with 24 seven security and her husband and her children. And before you even open your mouth, you have to know, like you said, even coming on this podcast, you already got death threats. 
Yeah. You know, you have to know, you don't have to be at Ion Hersielli level, you know, before they start to threaten your life. You don't have to be Salman Rushdie before they start. They to won't your wait life. that long. They, they don't wait. The that- minute, yeah. The minute yep. you open your mouth, you have put yourself in danger. So I had to make peace with that before I ever showed my face on the very first interview, you know? Yeah. But it's exactly what you said. You get to the point where you're, you have been silent for so long. You have been living in fear for so long that the rage finally, it just overrides the fear. I don't, I don't care anymore. I don't care. I'm not scared. Do what you need to do. And I'm going to do what I need to do. If it's with my dying breath, I'm going to speak my truth. Then I'm happy to do that. But I am not going to be silent and I am not going to be afraid any longer. I absolutely love having this freedom. I have risked my life and my daughter's life to get this freedom. So I will use every single drop of it, you know, like they, they, they've silenced me long enough. I'm done. I was speaking to a woman from Lebanon the other day and she's not Muslim, but because she's Lebanese, people just assume that yeah. she's Muslim, yeah. right? They're like, oh, you're Arab. You must be Muslim. And she was getting really irritated, especially around the Ramadan. People are like, oh, I'm sorry. I'm drinking my coffee in front of you. And she's like, just drink your fucking coffee. Like, I'm not I Muslim. Yeah. <laughs> like, why do you guys make this assumption? And I was like, girl, take that. I, I embrace that opportunity. Like, if somebody's like, assumes that I'm Muslim, I just... I love it because now I get an opportunity to tell you (laughs) exactly how not Muslim I am. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like it just, I, I mean, count the ways I think there are like this. These are about the first hundred ways your prophet had issues. Let's go to your Quran now. I know. I love it. And I've met so many ex-Muslims out in the wild, you know, just by being, by just by speaking up and just like very loudly telling people yeah. about how I'm not a Muslim and how I used to be and how I was forced into a marriage and forced into niqab. And now I'm, you know, I'm free from all that. And my daughters are free from all that. And, you know, it's, it's like, they've muzzled you for so long, literally in the fucking niqab, right? Like just, just muzzled yep. me yep. for so long. We used to get told that a woman's voice was out of, it's like nakedness. It's shame. Even my voice, I wasn't even allowed to speak. Right? Your wrist, if men yeah. will see your wrists or your ankles. All of a sudden yeah. they're going to ejaculate all over themselves yeah. and then, you know, yeah. have to stop themselves from trying to rape you because they saw yeah. your wrist. Um, but yeah, so it's like after being held down for so long, once you come out, it's like that Phoenix rising from the ashes, get out of the way. That's it. And like you You're said, so- that genie's not going back in the bottle. <laughs> so yeah, I'm really, I- really proud of you, Sarah. Thank you. When I was reading your book, that's, that's the word that kept popping up in my head. The words, human dignity, you were robbed of your human dignity. You did not know what it means. Like, that's what I am. Like I wish with all my being for women in Iran to understand what it means because my mom doesn't know. My grandma I didn't know for the longest time. I didn't know. I kept thinking it's respect. You respect people, you respect the elders, you respect your grandparents, you respect your, I don't know, husbands in laws, even if they want to just like they it's very difficult to understand the difference between human dignity and respect. And it mm. took me a long time to understand that. No, it's not respect that I have right now. I have human dignity. I have, like, I, I'm given this dignity to be, to exist, not to make myself smaller, not to crouch, not to just cover myself, not to hide because I'm scared that some men would get offended because I try to exist in his space. Like, I, this is the human dignity that I was robbed of for so long. And I want women to have it. I want women everywhere to understand it. That that you deserve to have this space and take up this space and exist and be free. And I was reading your story and I was reading how you're like, there, there, there are parts of your story that stays with me forever. 
One of them is how your daughter now has to have water every time she, she eats something because of something that happened to her. She, just, just a child who is, and that's the point that you realize that, that you need to do something before they talk even about the FGM. That was the moment that hurt you, I think, deeply. Or there are different parts of, like I was reading your book and I kept thinking, like I had to stop and think, she doesn't know me. She, this is not my story. Breathe. This is not your story. Nobody hacked your brain. This like, okay, come on, calm down. This is not your story. She's Canadian. What's wrong with you? And I, I told a friend about your book and she said, I don't have the bandwidth right now. Hmm. And I said, no, don't, don't read it now because it's triggering. It's hugely, immensely triggering for us. So you were talking about the differences, but there are so many similarities, so many different little bits and pieces. I was never forced into an agab, but my in-laws tried to force me into a chador. That was so out of the left field for me that like, what are you, what is happening? I already said no three times. I was offered jobs in really great places and I would pay, be paid in dollars if I wore chador. Like, no. No, I, I, I just teach and I'll get my money and I'll survive. But no, I'm not selling myself like that. Mm -hmm. And then I realized that's what I was trying to have. I was trying to have my human dignity and everybody was trying to push me down and trying to tell me that you don't deserve it. You have to submit. You're a Muslim girl. This is your function. You do what we tell you to do and you exist as a half. You are not full. You'll never be full. You'll never be complete. I want women to have that, that human dignity. Yeah. yeah. I mean, when they're born and raised in a religion where the most powerful almighty being creator of the universe tells them that they are half a man and that a man has the right to beat them and a man has the right to rape them. And the prophet of the religion talks about how women are deficient in intelligence and, you know, in spirituality, you don't ever even start to think that you might be deserving of human dignity because you've been told from the very beginning yes. that you are lesser than. And so you just accept that because it's all you've ever known. Your, so it's wives, like that, your wives are yeah. told unto you go in yeah. and plow them. I'm a farmland. But yeah. Okay. But it takes a lot to be able to get to that point to say, no, I'm not. And that, that I, it I, started I, from very, very young. Like I was seven yeah. and I had to cover up in order to leave the house. Like at seven mm -hmm. years old, you're told you're a farm, you're a piece of farmland and your husband mm -hmm. can do whatever he wants to you. Mm -hmm. And that's when the brainwashing has already started. So you do not understand what human dignity really means. Mm -hmm. you're, a, mm -hmm. you're a tilt for your mm -hmm. husband to plow. Okay. Anything else you want me to? It's like, like what, what is happening? Like, how is that okay? And I asked that question for a long, like, why are women silent? Why are they not coming out? Why are they not yelling and screaming and fighting back? Because I did not Fear. understand. Yeah, mm. all the people who were murdered during that first decade of the, the, the revolution in Iran, the Islamic regime killing and killing and killing and get the mass graves, mass executions. And I did not know about those things. Mm -hmm. I was a teenager when I started finding out why and how and silencing myself. Yeah, it's terrorism is very successful. You know, yes. that's, that's like... That's what they do with their stabbings and their trucks of peace. And it's the same kind of idea. Yeah. You just have to, you know, in, 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 you just kill a few people. And then for 20 years, everybody is going to stay in line and be afraid to say anything, afraid to be called Islamophobic or whatever. You know, it just, it, it is what does, what does that even mean, Islamophobic? Like, like it's not irrational fear. <laughs> I have no, 41 it's very years rational. of, it's, it's that my fear of Islam is very rational and very logical. 
like the traumas that I've experienced. It's it's not irrational. I promise. Mm. Like you want to silence me. This is like saying reverse racism yeah. or reverse sexism. These things do not exist because you wish them to. Yes, there mm. are discriminations against Muslims, but show me mm. one Muslim woman who was beaten to death for wearing hijab. Mm -hmm. show mm -hmm. me one it's not you cannot even compare and but they just it the it's like the women like us who push back and who say i want more i deserve more i am worth more yeah we are demonized by the left and right by yeah. east and west yeah like, I, <laughs> you know I, what I, mean? like I expected you just... the left to have our back i expected like like we talked about this me too well. like mm. mona al tahabi not not saying anything like not naming people not trying to like you were championing for a revolution in the middle east it's happening now why are you not coming out and supporting us instead of talking about menopause and your shaved head and the colors that you, like i understand those are important things that's your human dignity i understand it but you could use us for mm -hmm. just taking your own profession and your own status in the society to a higher level why don't you and she could talk about both things like nobody's saying she can't talk about her personal life that's great yeah. but maybe mention the fact that there's a revolution going on right now because a young girl was beaten to death oh the curse the curse is back Happening again. Again is happening. This is happening. <laughs> oh my gosh. This I is happening she's back. again. She's oh gonna no. be the curse. The curse is back. <laughs> <laughs> the gods are oh my gosh. Bring with us. Oh my god, I can't believe it. Maybe Allah okay. and Momo, Allah and Momo is working with something. He sent a fucking gin in my laptop, <laughs> Sarah. <laughs> <laughs> We are repenting. We are going back. This is what God wants us now. No, I'm not <laughs> repenting. <laughs> I'll just go to my Muslim. phone. <laughs> we will so continue happening. this conversation. We, want to <laughs> we are not stopping. I'll come back next no. week. I don't care. Well, next yeah, week you yeah. have somebody else. I'll come back the week after. <laughs> we are no, not giving no. up. We, we got rid of the gin, hopefully. <laughs> <laughs> um, we were getting too serious. serious. Yeah, yeah. So I want to make sure that everybody on this call has a chance to ask you any questions that they have for you or any comments. I, Ira, I remember last time you were in the conversation, you were asking about Turkey and I was so pessimistic and I was so negative. Oh, and, oh, and it came out bad. <laughs> it came out as bad as I imagined it would, unfortunately. But anyway, let's... Um, if you have any questions for, for Sarah, sorry, go ahead. And anybody who does, just unmute yourself and jump in. Oh, I have a terribly insignificant question. You said you had a rabbit. I have a tattoo of a rabbit. Oh, I was wondering how it got along with the cats, but I guess it no, gets... <laughs> it's from Alice. It's from Alice in Wonderland. He was the one that had severe anxiety for time and trying to get everything in and not be headed by the direct queen. Yes. So this is the thing that I related to. That was the book that ah. fit and everybody belonged. And I turned 40 and I thought I'm 40 and I'm still alive and I belong to this world. Yes. It doesn't matter if I don't fit, but I chose the rabbit because he's got severe anxiety. Good. <laughs> and you've, you've come out from the rabbit hole. No, I don't think so. <laughs> I don't think I'll ever be because the world doesn't make sense. Like the UN choosing Iran to be the General Assembly's vice president doesn't make, it doesn't compute. There are things that will never compute, but that's the Western society. I've stopped trying to understand it. Tell us about the other tattoos that you have. Uh, the Little Prince, and you know, this is again, Haram in Iran. As a Muslim, you are not supposed to cover your body because whatever. Uh, I was 
in Canada for three years and I survived the immigration to Canada. So I thought I'll have, I'll just give myself one for surviving. I have one on my back, it's a nymph. It's a wood nymph from Shakespeare. Uh, there's one part in Hamlet that says- Midsummer Night's Dream? Oh. No, Ofer Ophelia in, in the horizons be my, sorry, I don't remember the quote now. That's okay. <laughs> Uh, it's not it's like a prayer I, i'm not i don't believe in god but i have two different things that are prayers this is one that's a wood nymph uh because i survived my first husband he did not kill me and i'm going to get really really dark for a minute i tried to kill myself because of him it did not take and i hate the idea of attempted suicide i killed myself it did not work that's it i actually did that i was not very good at it so I came out the other end, but that's what severe depression and not wanting to be alive in that in, with him. That was the thing that, that happened, whatever. So I have him surviving him. I have uh, two dragons. Some people say fighting, some people say kissing. It depends on how you see it. I got that after surviving Dubai and after surviving, divorcing him and having to get married to somebody and deciding to come to Canada in the span of two years and paying $60,000 worth of loan in two years because he wanted to buy a house. And right after we bought it, he decided that he doesn't want to be married to me anymore. So surviving Dubai is one of them. And then I got really badly harassed at work by one of my bosses because she could pick and choose people who had been abused and knew how to, it's like, we have this sign on our foreheads that, oh, this person was abused before. Now let's do some more damage because this is a very good target. And I survived that person as well. And I have a tattoo of a girl sitting next to two small cats with the lines, teach us to care and not to care, teach us to sit still, which is again, another line from Ash Wednesday by T.S. Eliot. So it's a lot of, and then Frida. Frida. I, I got a diagnosis for severe anxiety, minor depression, PTSD, panic disorder last year. And I thought, I have all the different things that could go wrong neurologically. <laughs> so let's get Frida and remember that she survived way worse. So you can survive those things too. Not yeah. enough, I need more. And it's not, this is not finished. Like Frida is not finished. You have to go back and do some more work on it. That's beautiful. Thank, Thank you. you for sharing those all with us. Thank you. Thank you for asking. <laughs> Frida's my favorite out of all of those. She is such an oddball. Like she never fit either. And she was intentional. Like with everything she did, she just knew that she's different and she just embraced it. And I think I, I, I sometimes think to myself, what would my life be like if I had just had that much courage? If I had just said from the very beginning to hell with you guys, I'm doing what I'm doing. I don't care. But then I might have been murdered by somebody at some point very early on. Mm. Yeah. I have a special reason for loving Frida. So, you know, my book is dedicated to my friend Tiffany. Yes. And she was a huge, she's the one who introduced me to Frida. So oh. yeah, huge fan. So that's why I special place in my heart for Frida. That's beautiful. <laughs> she, yeah. She was also really weird about the men that she had crushes on. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I just saw this. She had a crush on um, the bald guy from Star Trek, Patrick something. I know. Uh, that was like one of her crushes and another professor one was Ix? He's professor Ix. yeah professor x in uh x-men yes that's right i know <laughs> and uh and the actor who's uh severus snape um andy something rather that was another one of her crushes like it always perplexed me because we were friends as teenagers and she's got like these really obscure old men that's a that's interesting and you probably were thinking, uh, I, I'll just have to survive this next few days. You do not have time for crushes. I was talking to a friend about this, that like she, she's also 40 and she's talking about 
doing a master's degree and going through her, I don't know, whatever, wants to do this and this and this for future. And I said, at this point, I just want to just, just die happily. I don't have any hopes and ambitions. And we started laughing and I said, well, we should have thought about these things when we were 17 or 18. And she said, well, when I was 17, I was trying not to die and not to kill myself because she was also very depressed. And I said, that's interesting. I was in Iran and all I wanted to do was survive. Like when I was 17, all I was thinking about is not dying. I'm not mm -hmm. dying. That's like being a stubborn. I'm not dying. Mm -hmm. Thank you for deciding to survive so you could live to tell us the tale and begin to become yourself. Uh, I lived for years hidden inside myself, barely existing. Uh, I am now semi-existing. I, I haven't made it all the way out. No one ever does make it all the way out. Uh, and I think most people uh, suppress their inner harlot and they're very proud. It makes them, they're playing the game that they're told makes them a successful, good person. I achieved uh, some, yeah. And most of them take it to the graves with themselves. Yeah. I wonder at the, the last moment when they're dying, what they think of it. They probably are still telling themselves the story that this makes them a success. We are a good person. I'm a good person for not having allowed my desires to come out or not having enjoyed my life. Yeah. How does that make you a good person? I don't know. I hope you get to exist fully <laughs> and completely because you've said to me before that you deserve to be here. And you deserve to be happy. So, thank you. you. Thank you. <laughs> You're as goddesses are cats. So that I, was a purring. I know. I saw the cat picture. I know we talked oh, about right. it. Oh, right. Yeah. <laughs> the one who lived for 20 years. Yes, cats kept me alive too and provided companionship in a world in which I was all alone with myself except for my cats. And yes, I had friends, but you know, it, there was always this veil between us, so to speak. Cats are different. They don't understand that you have anxiety or depression or you're tired. Like they have expectations. They rule the house, you have to follow, you have to feed them, you have to take care of them, you have to get out of your head. Even for 10 minutes, you have to get out and you have to exist fully. It's beautiful. And I'm like, I, I'm not gonna teach them no. I'll just follow them and I'll just feed them and I'll just serve them and I don't care. <laughs> I'll be back at home every day at six o'clock because that's what I do now. That's, I have cats. <laughs> that's it. And when people have cats, they get it. I have cats. You're the staff. Yes, <laughs> exactly. Thank you for understanding. Uh, all right. Uh, Mishair, Sahara, Nasra, Aliyah, anybody want to unmute yourself and ask any questions or share anything with Sarah? Aliyah is writing something for us in the chat. Should I read it for you, Aaliyah, or are you going to unmute yourself and say it? Hi. Hi. Hello. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for uh, coming here and being so brave and inspirational, sharing your story. I cannot imagine, you know, when you said chicken cut, head and marinated chicken and grapes, I was just completely like, I don't understand, you, you know? Yes, um, you should be really, really proud of yourself. All of us, I am so proud of you, and I'm so glad that you're here and you're able to share, you know, your story. Um, and do you want to comment? Looks like the gym is in your laptop now, Aaliyah. <laughs> <laughs> we had trouble hearing you. Um, but yeah, I'm going to have to Google that chicken thing because I need to know more about that. But Aliyah also said in the comments here, she said, oh, I'm perfectly happy to be known as a witch and a shaitan out of control woman, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> according to relatives, Muslim community and Muslims. Yeah, absolutely. We, as they say, we are the daughters of the witches that they could not burn. <laughs> 
this is that's yeah. a beautiful thing and two different things i want to talk about first last week they were like everybody was lovely and kind and gracious reminding me that i yes i say that this i'm not i'm a nobody and i don't have anything like I did not write a book I did not survive anything huge I did not but there are so many little 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 things that they turn out to be a mountain of things that you have to overcome to survive to be here and it's my story and I have to share my story so that everybody else can hear it and I cried a couple of times everybody was fantastic about this whole thing and the other thing you just said that we are the daughters of the witches that they could not burn. And there's a saying in Iran that they say, if there's one of us left to dance on your graves, mm. that'll be enough. Mm. That'll be enough. If there's just one of us left. So I'm trying to survive and I'm thinking everybody else is doing the same thing at this point. We are fighting, we are pushing back, we are raising our voices however we can little bits and pieces here and there, raising awareness, having people know that they should push back, that Islamophobe is just, just an excuse to shut you down. It's just a fallacy, it's not real. So don't, please don't be respectful. Please don't take it. Please don't just smile and say, it's not my problem. I don't understand it. Maybe you're right. No, speak. Say, Sarah said this, and Sarah is an ex-Muslim. And Sarah gave me all the, the different verses in Quran, according to which a gender apartheid is a normal thing to be in because women are just a piece of land and men have mm -hmm. to plow them. So no, that's not something I can respect. And that's what we want. We just want to dance on their graves. I mm -hmm. want revenge. That's why I want revenge. I want to dance on their graves. You know, Sarah, you, you've, you've said that before, um, you know, I'm, I, I'm a nobody, I haven't written a book, blah, blah, blah. Like, we all feel that way. Uh, we, when you said, um, I haven't been through anything huge, like, I just, I, I had to stop myself from interrupting you and being like, what? <laughs> you know, but we all feel that way. I didn't, for the longest time, people would be like, oh, you need to write your book. And I'm like, write my book about what? You know how many women are forced into marriages? millions yeah you know how many kids you know we've all there's i've yeah. known so many people that have the exact same story as me and way worse yeah. that the thought of me like sharing my story felt so insignificant i was like no nobody nobody's gonna care like it's such a common story That's and exactly i was really how surprised yeah. yeah exactly because but, we hear you know, this every day every year all the time it's all around us and mm -hmm. I'm this. I'm engulfed in this. So, so this misogyny to me, like I taught my mom and dad come here every once in a while, and they're watching something, and we keep having this argument, argument again and again. This is misogynistic. This is not except. Why are you watching? This is not entertainment. What are? No, 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 no. You like this one? No, 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 no. Don't worry about. No, she's not gonna die in this one. Nobody's gonna kill her. Oh, you're gonna love this guy. Wait for it. It's just such a redemption story. You're gonna. And to me, it's like mind boggling. Like, how do you not see that this is a problem? But to them. It's their lives. We are all living similar stories. So to us, to me, it's like, what do I talk about? What do I say that nobody has heard before that makes it interesting for them to listen to my story and to actually pay attention mm -hmm. and not tune out this whole conversation and think, oh, this is just another woman complaining about her life. But that's because we were living in societies where this was all normalized, you know, but when you speak to like a normal person <laughs> from a healthy society, their face contorts and their jaw drops and you realize, oh, so this is a normal. <laughs> like I have a story for you. I was in Dubai working in a high school and I, I'm teaching English to middle schoolers. And this is a high school that has a lot of Canadians and Americans and also Arab teachers or different people from Europe, like everybody's there. So it's a huge group and it's an IB school. So they are very high level, demanding, very high standards. And I'm teaching and I'm very successful. 
For the first time in my life, I realized that I'm a good teacher. My students like me. I'm doing a really great job. And that's one of the reasons why my husband could not stay anymore because he could not break me after that realization. But it, I, I digress. That's, that's what I do all the time. Sorry. So I went into the staff room to get water. I wanted to have some hot water for my tea. And I walk in and there's this Arab teacher. I think he was Egyptian. So... <laughs> You know where this story is going to go. He's talking. Probably, I to, know it's going to go somewhere not good. <laughs> he's talking to. I saw a couple of women sitting there, and it's just first couple of months. I'm like maybe the first two months I'm there, so it's maybe in the middle of November. I don't know everybody. These are all new people. It's all new to me. I'm just trying to adjust and survive and understand that oh, with all these changes, it's normal. I'm okay. I'm good. It's fine. Don't worry about. It. Breathe. And I walk in and I'm trying to get my hot water, and he's talking to to our two women. Who, who are blonde, that's all I registered. Both blonde sitting there, he's talking to them in Arabic and he turns around and starts talking to me in Arabic. And I, I just laughed and said, I don't understand you. I understand Arabic, but I don't understand you. And then he said, oh, you understand Arabic? I said, yeah, but it's like you understanding Jeffrey Chaucer at this point and studying to read Canterbury Tales because I studied Arabic to read Quran. And he goes, are you a Muslim? And when I was reading that part about you in your book about how you felt like the panic attack that you, that's one of the, the, the places I thought, okay, this is not, you breathe, you are not there, stop, stop, it's not. So I, I looked at him and I thought, like, I can't say no, because I just outed myself. And even if I, I don't out myself, he could just look my name up. I'm in the directory of the school. I have a Persian name. I'm from Iran. It's a Muslim country. So very quickly I'm computing and I said yeah I'm a Muslim I, I, I thought I was taught Arabic from the age of seven in order to read Quran not to speak it and he said so you don't understand Arabic but like, no I don't understand your Arabic I understand Quran and he looked at me and I had I was wearing a dress that had like I, you could see my neck very short sleeves up to here and it was up to my knees but I had tights underneath so it was below my calf. So you could see maybe this much of my legs. And of course, I'm not wearing a headscarf because I don't have to in Dubai. And he, he looks at me and he goes, so you have to cover up. I'm like, N I don't want to, but you have to cover up. You'll go to hell. If you don't cover up, you'll go to hell. I'm like, I, I don't want to. And I'm just trying to get out of the room and not talk to him anymore and just just but no you don't understand and he was trying to flirt with me in Arabic and it's just just got turned around and it got really hostile very quickly but you burn in hell you have to cover your fit your hair and you can only show your face and your hands you should not show anybody any parts of your body I'm like, I, I don't want to thank you bye and I did not say anything to anybody and we took his students to like I was one of the head teachers to take a group of students on a trip to India and we had the vice president vice principal of the school going on a trip we were sitting next to the fire and this is in May the same year like months have gone by and I thought this is a funny story because everybody's telling stories about their experiences in Dubai and whatever they've had like the culture shock and we're, and I started saying the story and nobody's laughing <laughs> and usually when I say something, it's so awkward because people think I'm joking and I'm not joking. I'm just talking about how horrifying things are and people laugh because they feel awkward about it. And he looked at me and this is this older guy in his 60s. And he looked at me and said, but he was harassing you. I'm like, no, he wasn't. He was, he, he was just saying, but why did you not report this? And I looked at him and said, report him for what? And he said, but for harassment. He cannot talk to you. And he was livid on my behalf. What were you wearing? Were you showing lots of skin? Were you naked? Even if you were naked, he's not allowed to do that to you. And, and he's asking these questions rhetorically. Like he's not asking what were you wearing in that sense of it. Mm -hmm, like mm -hmm. he was like, you should have reported this. Why did you not report this? I'm like, but I didn't know. I, I didn't know I could. And we went back. But you're to still in the UAE though. Like, yes, I but mean, they put this in his reports. Like if they put this in his files, they asked him to go in and they and he said, did you have any witnesses? And I said, there were two women, they were blonde. I don't remember. And he had to do this whole research and investigation and talk to different people to find out who was in the office there. And he That's found wonderful. out found witnesses and put this in his file. And they told him, oh, you cannot beautiful. talk. 
And I thought that was the time that I realized that not everything is normal the way I think yeah. it's normal. Yeah. Was so, this, you said it was an IB school. What, yeah. What was, it, was it an American school or? It was an American school. Mm, okay, that's great. When I used to teach in Qatar, so all of the cafeterias would shut down during Ramadan for because yes. Muslims can't eat, even though, <laughs> you know, obviously not all our students are Muslim, but the American schools didn't shut their cafeterias down. Yep. They were the only school who did it. The Canadians yeah. did, of course, because yeah. that's what we are. We're just like complacent. But I was like so proud of the American schools. I'm like, yes. Yeah. yeah. Texas a and <laughs> Yeah, good for you. We were not allowed <laughs> to <USA>. eat food. <laughs> but we could get the food and come back into our offices and we would just eat together because nobody's fasting. Yeah. Not in our we department. Couldn't, we weren't allowed to do that. In the, yeah. in the Canadian school, we're not allowed to do that because they said that the students might smell the food if you've warmed it up or something like that. Yeah. We And, and we weren't even allowed to paper up our offices so that we could have like water oh my in the searing desert because they said no it's because if you put the paper up they're going to know that you're eating in there so, like you just you have to be respectful you have no. to be respectful for me that was my yeah. first encounter with a culture that did not ask me to submit and allow yeah, me to express this and it was just it was mind-boggling for the first couple yeah. of months like why 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 is this okay like this is ramadan i i can still eat I don't have to hide. I don't have to just just pretend anymore. But that's that's so great that that head teacher did that for you and sort of you didn't even know to defend yourself or to protect yourself or to even be offended. You know what yeah. I mean? But he saw really? like your humanity. Yeah. And you're that's what happened. Like, no, you deserve better. You deserve more. Yeah. Every day you walk down the street, there's somebody who is catcalling or groping or mm -hmm. I don't know, touching mm -hmm. you without your consent. Everybody's telling mm -hmm. you what to wear and not what to wear and how mm -hmm. to be. So him mm -hmm. doing that was just an extension. And it was so mm -hmm. normalized in my head. And I'm sitting there thinking, I am a feminist, right? I, I do understand my autonomy, right? And why, why wasn't mm. I offended? Why didn't I, and I didn't know that I could raise this. I didn't know that like it was just this seething mm. anger, silence inside me that I had to just grin and bear it. Mm -hmm. And he reminded me that, nope, not in the school, not with us. You have a voice. Oh, that's beautiful. Thank you. I'm happy that you crossed paths with that person. That's lovely. Thank you. I'm sure, Michelle, I'm sure you have a story like that. I just know you do. Because <laughs> <laughs> she grew up in Saudi Arabia. Oh, and, wow. Yeah. And is now oh, living. You. And uh, there's actually a story in my head just at work, similar to what you were saying. And I didn't know it was an abuse until today. I mean, not an abuse, I mean, harassment until today. When I thought, wait, that was not right. So there was this Egyptian. Fucking <laughs> Egyptian, man. Holly, <laughs> when I worked in Dubai, he just sat next to me and he went, you know, I'm married and I love my wife. And I'm like, oh. Good for and you. He, right. And then he goes, you know, can you believe this? I have actually never seen my wife naked. This is how a good girl she is. So this is so random. What makes <sighs> you think I want to know that very intimate information? And so I didn't say anything. I have absolutely no reciprocation with this conversation. And he continues, he carries on. He goes like, for example, when we are you know, planning to get together, she, he told me this weird thing where she has to go under the sheets and she lifts her things. Yeah, that's right. This is Where's the gym? Now, now I need the gym in my laptop. This is how uncomfortable <laughs> I, I want to hear the rest things. of this. I yeah. love this conversation. And then he was like, and then she turns the light off and she says, oh, you can come in now. And I'm sitting there horrified, thinking to myself, why would you tell me that? 
Why do you need to know this? Why do I need to know that? And Ew. Oh, wow. today with like learning how this is a very, it's a harassment. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And I am strong enough to stand up for myself and say, screw you. Don't yeah. tell me that. Yeah. It would have gone completely different. But I had to sit there freaked out, shut down, and just all, you know how mm -hmm. we are when we're sexually I know. harassed. We're just so like, we just want to be a turtle that just goes inside the shell. And that's mm -hmm. who I was. And yes, we do have a lot of conversations like that. I always think like the first thing, even now, even after all these times, I, what did I do? Well, how, how did I invite this conversation? What if, was it? And even, and then I realized that I'm going through that whole thing again. I'm like, screw this. Even if I did anything, even if it's my tattoos or my blue hair or me being very loud and very not Muslim or being, I don't know. I don't care. Even if I invited these conversations, screw you, step back. Absolutely. That's not acceptable. Absolutely. To just walk in and think it's my right to volunteer and give this information to this poor person. Because honestly, I feel like they're predators and yeah. they know that. Because this goes back to your conversation earlier about the employee who was tough on you or traumatized you and that you made you get that tattoo yeah that predators see they really see that weak traumatized mm -hmm. abused Target. person and they make sure they take as much advantage as they can yeah they see mm -hmm. and it's interesting because we blame ourselves we always think what did i do to invite this but it's because not something we raised like that yeah to take responsibility for the whole world and carry the burden and be very good and respectful and kind and nice and polite and not talk back and like and if i was not the only one that got targeted a lot of women with mental health issues women from third world countries who did not know their rights like she would then it was a woman who would target us and I, I kept thinking I deserve this kind, like for the longest time, I thought I deserve this kind of behavior from her. I deserve this, this belittling attitude. I deserve her insults. And it took me a long time to realize that no, no, it's just another part of this whole harassment and abuse cycle that I'm allowing to happen. Stop. Yeah. Don't, don't take it. It's not your fault. It's not anything you did. You just existed as an abuse victim and she could just read the signs and manipulate you furthermore yeah that's all you did wrong if you ever did anything wrong like you existed in that situation that you were talking about you existed as a woman and that was probably enough for this person yeah exactly and as a predator he would see which woman would just sit back and say nothing yeah this wasn't something that was like out of the blue i'm sure he thought about it and he just looked through and yeah he knows who to target yeah yeah i'm sorry you had to go through that thank you i am sorry i had to go through that too so <laughs> thank you yeah and i i i certainly apologize on behalf of, I don't understand why Muslim men are going around, or, or sorry, Egyptian men, Muslim men are too, but Egyptian men are, are going around harassing women, but that's what, I mean, did you guys see the statistics in Egypt? 99.3% of women in Egypt report being sexually harassed. In that country, I mean, it sounds like I'm hyperbole, right? It sounds like I no, made no, that up. That can't be no. possibly 99.3. That's insane. 99.3. So no. in, in that country, it is so beyond normalized. It is celebrated. It is celebrated. So when that guy was talking to you, both of you, when that man was talking to you and you were squirming and you were uncomfortable, and he knew that he was had the power over you 
That's what it's all about. That's what they always do. That's the MO. Even if they, it's about control, it's about power. It's about, yeah, I can make you feel uncomfortable. And it's unfortunate that that's so common. And I'm sorry that you both had to yeah. experience that. Oh my God. Aaliyah has an Egyptian story too. I gotta, <laughs> Please tell us. I give up. up. It's, it's, it's a lot of time. It's still interfering. Can you guys hear me? No, Can you I, I never up? Yeah, now. this is like going in and out. Now? Oh, that's better. Now? Yes. Yeah? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. So back, back in the days when we used to go, you know, inside of the banks, right? Um, I mean, you, you, like, you're not sure if you can hear me. No, we can't. Back, back in the day, what? In and out, yeah. No. 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 Say, something. Say a sentence so we know that we can hear you. No. No. It's it's better, but it's one word. Maybe if you say more, it'll cut again. Oh my goodness. Shaitan, you guys oh, and mama. I think so annoying. I, I think I think you're okay now. Try again. Okay. Can you guys hear me now? Yes. Yes. It's much clearer. Okay. So this was back in the days when we used to go inside of the bank. Right? And there was a big teller. Oh, no. We can't hear her. I want to no. hear this story, but Aliyah. I know. You got to get she rid of the shaydan on your lap laptop. The shaydan on your oh, laptop. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> Say no, no to Momo. Maybe it'll, it'll work. No, no to Momo. Yeah, yeah, we got it. Try again. No, no, to Momo. No, no, to Momo. Here, that one is better and clear. No, no, to Momo. No, no, to Momo. There yeah, now go. speak you again. Try again. Try again. Okay. Back in the days when we used to go. Oh. Oh crap. No. It seems like it seems like when you're practicing or testing it, it's fine, and then maybe you move away from the mic or something. Oh, she's frozen. Oh, she said. She's oh. In the comments, she said, I have a story since we're on the Egyptian bandwagon, LOL, but the gin in my laptop <laughs> may interfere. Uh, okay, this is the last time I'm going to try. You're is this good. better? Keep going. Yep. Tell okay. us the story quick. So this was back in the days when we actually used to go inside of, of the banks. There was a bank mm -hmm. teller who was half Egyptian, half Palestinian. He always was trying to flirt with me. You know, I used to see him in Starbucks. And then, you know, there was this one day where he was like, you know, you would be, you're so gorgeous that you would be even more gorgeous with the hijab on. I'm telling you, one day, mark my words, you are going to wear that hijab. Mark my words. And I'm going to ask your father for your hand. I was like, this is so disgusting. <laughs> I was like, you can mark my words. I will never wear this hijab. Yes. So well the height done. of he your life. So sure. He was so sure that I was going to put this on one day just because he said so. <laughs> Great. audacity of some people like this is the highlight of your life that you will put on the job <laughs> and i'll come to your father and i'll ask for your hand and you'll be so happy and you'll be so pleased that you would say yes please come take oh my god i'm sorry yes oh my goodness i i hated going inside like like the bank but yeah yeah That's he thinks he's the prize that He's the prize that you might win, Aaliyah, if you play your cards right. <laughs> you still have time. Think about it really hard. Oh, gross.
So Nasra, Janus, Sahara, tell us about the Egyptian. <laughs> oh my God. Can I tell you Era, the Somali assholes? Can I, I talk about the Somali assholes, man? Um, well, this is uh, horrific, um, but you know, I did what I could uh, when I was in Kenya. I was in Nairobi. And uh, I, this was when I escaped from my family, you know, when they beat me and almost killed me, but thankfully I escaped. And I was staying with my aunt just until I get, actually it was in Nairobi, I take it back. It was Garissa, like before, you know, before I got to the big city. So I was staying with my aunt, the one who was part of me. She was part of beating me, you know, part of the abuse. But I had to stay a place until I get to whatever, you know, uh, place I can get. I was looking for a job as a nanny, as a maid. Uh, so I was staying at her house and her friend, neighbor, a guy, a Somali dude, came to her room and literally harassed me, uh, forced me, kissed me, like to, for, that, that was my first time. And I didn't know what to do. My aunt wasn't home. I, when I told her, of course, she didn't believe me. And, and I remember just pushing the fucking guy, you know, away and just trying to escape because he, I could have been raped. And, and if I'm raped, it's my fault. It's, it's not his fault. So I just kind of, I slapped him, pushed him, and just ran as fast as I could, ran to the bathroom, crying, just didn't know what to do. Um, my aunt came home later on. I told her she didn't believe me, and nobody else believed me. And it's just, this these horrible stories happen. Um, and, and the rape that takes place, and the harassment, and... It's, it's just disgusting because if we talk, it's our fault. What, what was I? What was I doing? What was I wearing? I was still wearing the freaking hijab. I was wearing abaya. And this dude just came to me. And, and I didn't even know what to do. I, I was um, pre-teen. Like, I was 14, 15. I didn't know what the fuck to do. Like, this growing man coming to me, kissing me, force. And it's just, I, I don't know. I'm, I'm still trying, like... Actually, to make sense how I fucking survived that it didn't turn into a rape, you know, that shit. But, um, yeah, so so that's kind of uh, the crap happens even in the mask, in the mosque, in, in the Muslim community. So, um, but I want to say, Sarah, um, thank you for coming here. Thank you for sharing your story. And it takes really, you know, a courage person, a brave individual to come and to share your story, what you've been through. And you are badass survivor, and we are with you. And absolutely, you know, when I was also coming and just saying, like, I need to talk because we need to talk. We need to have this conversation. We need to we need to use our voice. And the silent voices in Islam is 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 exist. They exist, and they are there. And it's time for us to speak. And we're not going to be silent. But I'm proud of you. We are so proud of you. I'm so glad you're part of the No No to Momo Club, the Haram, the Sharmuta Club, you know, all of it. So welcome and uh, love and respect. And I'm glad you survived all the horrific things you've been through. So glad to have you. And also, I'm sorry you're living in a lally land, a shithole, uh, Trudeau, like Tuto, we call him Tuto. Trudeau fucking made him Islamophobia. I, I can't really even wrap around my head this word because you guys this word i was called islamophobia while i was in the shit i was wearing hijab and that was the first time i heard islamophobia somebody called me islamophobia because i talked about fgm in the somali community that 90 percent girls are subjected female genital mutilation and nobody wants to talk about it right that shit somehow muslim individuals they are allergic to their own shit but they like to talk about other people's shit. But I was talking about this subject about FGM, and I remember this was 2017, um, and then 2017, uh, no, 2016, um, when I was having a conversation with individual, a Muslim, and she said, you've been Islamophobia, and you need to stop, you know, uh, doing this, because what you are doing is, like, you're hurting the Muslim community, or especially, you're shaming the fucking Somali community. I'm like, uh, they need to be exposed. There's shitholes happening here in the United States. There's a child marriage happening within in here in the United States. There's uh, FGM happening behind the scene, and we need to talk about it. And then I was labeled Islamophobia. I didn't even know what that means. I had to go Google it. 
find out what that means that that I hated Islam and I hated Muslim and yeah I don't like Islam I, I hate him Muslim and I'm kind of like bigot and I'm just like I'm still fucking in this shit so then I have to go you know that kind of lead me to my rabbit hole when I have to study Islam and then of course I you know left later on I couldn't rationalize the shit um but there's a lot of other incidents when I was also told I could be killed by individual a Somali woman that because if I leave Islam I deserve to die too but but that also incident to wake wake me up and here I am and I said you know what f Islam there's nothing special about Islam and we need to talk about it and we need to expose the shitty culture uh, if you are saying FGM is a shitty uh, I mean if you're saying FGM is a culture and not Islam it still is a shitty culture and we need to talk about it but I just wanted to say I know I ran to hear F at all and peace and love and thank you for letting me talk and we are all together uh, and again they're not gonna kill us all of us they're not gonna come and kill us all of us we're gonna continue to speak dear Muslim I, I don't hate you I don't have any thing against you you can practice your religion but we have a right to leave to dissent to talk about it to criticize uh there's nothing special about islam and you need to get over it uh and if you get triggered uh go you know sh uh, shake it off whatever you sh need to sh do and it's okay you know you can get offended but you have no right to hurt individuals or silent us or label us islamophobia which I found that this word is so ridiculous, doesn't make sense. I mean, the Islamophobia word, when I hear it, I roll my eyes because I was labeled Islamophobia when I was fucking in this shit and wearing hijab. So it doesn't make sense. It's to silence you, it's to literally, uh, to silence any individuals who speaks about Islam. It's not because they care about Muslims. They don't give any fuck about Islam. So thank you for letting me speak and thank you and love and peace. Thank, Thank you. you. And no, not to Momo. No, not to Momo. <laughs> no, not to Momo. Thank you for your kind words. And I'm sorry you had to go through that. I have to go and watch your episode. I have to go and watch a lot of episodes. I did my homework. I watched a couple before we do the first one, but it's a lot of things they have to cover. A couple of things I wanted to talk about in regards to what Sarah is saying that. Number one, I'm sorry you had to go through that. I'm happy that you did not get raped. And I know that it's a still painful. Like it's a still assault. It's a still traumatizing. It's a still, is something you have to carry with the rest of your life, for the rest of your life. And I'm sorry that that's the burden you're carrying. And thank you for speaking up. Thank you for your kind words. And well, she was talking about if she was raped, it was her fault that that's something that like it's not even a weapon anymore that's like there, there are stories about girls who were hanged or, or who were executed i don't know if they were hanged or ever they, they were shot during the first decade of the islamic revolution and they would be raped the night before their execution because virgins go to heaven and if one of the officers raped this virgin right before she was executed, they would not let her go to heaven because she's not a virgin anymore. She's a sinner. And they would go to heaven for having belittled and humiliated and tortured a kafir or ex-Muslim or whatever. So, there are, and then they come out and say, no, these are not just, these are not true. These are not, they're just stories. It's not real. There are, there's testimony after testimony after testimony. Like there was this, I don't know how much time we have. I want to talk about Atefed. She, she, I don't know. Do we have enough time for another? We're, we're actually an hour over time. <laughs> oh, oh my God. I did not even but notice. No, that's okay. But the, the thing is, these stories are endless. You're right, Sarah. And and I think BBC did a, a sort of an expose about that, where they spoke to so many girls who had been imprisoned in Iran, and they, they were able to share free. their stories. Yeah. This That's a common thing, unfortunately, that that so you you don't, you know, if you don't wear your hijab properly, you have to fear being beaten to death, being raped, 
being tortured, you know, like there's so many stories. Where, ugh, I don't even want to get into it, but like they talk about how hijab is a choice, and it always makes me angry when I see women who are covering their 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 heads. And I know we're over time, but I want to talk about this because this is you mentioned hijab, and I just remembered that it makes me live it that I see women covering. I say, well, it's my choice. But it's my I, it's my it's my freedom. It's my no. Your choice is being used as a tool of oppression. As long as your choice is a tool of oppression, it's not a choice anymore. They are using it to oppress us. Stop wearing it for as long as it's a tool. Then we are all free to wear what we are. We want to to wear. Then okay, go ahead by all means. Cover yourself in niqab and burkini and whatever. I don't really care. But as long as that choice is being used to suppress me and subjugate me, it's not a choice anymore. It's you are just part of the problem. You are just a tool. My final rant. I promise. No. Yeah. No. I. I... I agree, foot soldiers for the patriarchy. Yeah. But I actually am gonna give you the, the final word before we wrap up. Um, if there's just anything that you wanna share with anyone, you wanna share your Twitter handle or your blog. Uh, Ira, <laughs> you wanted to say something. Yes, uh, I wanted to give a benediction for the great cat in the sky. May he <laughs> his, send his purr and his blessings to all of you so that we may be all there dancing on their graves. Hallelujah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much, Beautiful. Sahara. Thank you, Ira. Thank you. And Yasmin and Sahara and everyone. I think Sahara is providing a great oasis in the desert for, <laughs> for us to survive at until that day. <laughs> Love it. I will definitely be opening the hell. So I will see you guys. I'll be <laughs> waiting you at the door. Yay. Yes. And we then cool in, your, cool in you with ice cream and whatever pool and haram stuff I will be having. In a cone? Fire. <laughs> <laughs> so my last word, I just want to say thank you for writing the book, for giving voice to us when nobody else did for not focusing on just one part of what is wrong with this religion, not making that whatever you want, like not making it that tool that you want to express your frustration and your issues for coming out and for being so calm. Like, I don't know how you do it. I watched a couple of your podcasts with different people and I sit there and think, how is she not screaming? And yeah, like, how, I want to do that. I want to be like, I want to be you when I grow up. Honestly, and I think, like, when I say that, I, oh. I, I know that we are so close in age. I'm like, but how, how, how is she not angry and not yelling at me? How is she keeping that calm and just speaking and telling them, but this is the verse in Quran that says this. And, and, and I had to go back and remember a lot of these verses that I had tried for years to forget because now I'm actively fighting people on Twitter. So it's not just me being angry and ranting about laws. I'm taking different things from the actual book and throwing back at them. So mm -hmm. thank you for giving me the tools. Thank you for being a role model. Thank you for giving us a voice and standing with us for all these months. I know it's exhausting. Revolutions are exhausting. Life is sometimes, as an ex-Muslim, is just exhausting. And I really appreciate having you letting us talk, letting us express our pain and our fear and our misery and our victories. You have no idea. Like coming, talking to you, even on Twitter, when I say something and you respond, I feel like I am seen, I exist. I'm not just a ghost in my head. I, it matters. And you give us that. And I know how exhausting and tiring it is. Thank you for writing the book. Thank you for raising your voice. And to everybody else, I really appreciate you guys. You have no idea. This week, last week, this has been an amazing experience. And it's just sort of, it feels like now I can talk about this huge thing that I, I have arrived. I have talked to people about this and they have listened and it matters. So I really appreciate you guys. If you're on Twitter, Yasmin has already shared my picture and my handle. Anya found me, she sent a message that I, this is my name and it was really nice because then I can follow her back and I keep in touch. 
I don't usually people follow people back because I don't know what they want and who they are. So I'm being very picky and choosy about whoever I want to be in touch with. Please let me know if you're on Twitter and I can follow you back and we can be in touch and maybe continue the conversation afterwards. Wonderful, beautiful. Thank, Thank you, you so much, Sarah. This is Thank just you. the beginning. This conversation will continue. I hope to see you joining more and more of these podcasts and Definitely. continuing to share your voice, con continuing to share your stories, um, continuing to celebrate women like you who have been through it all and have come out the other side, other harlots, <laughs> other fellow <laughs> harlots. Um, yes. So yeah, this is just the beginning. I'm very, very proud of you. Thank this you. was a, a huge step. And, and I'm grateful to you and I'm grateful to every single one of the women who have come on this podcast and who have shared their stories because that gives me life. It gives me hope. It inspires me and it motivates me to continue. And I know that's what it's, we are throwing pebbles out into the universe and causing all sorts of ripple effects. Yeah. I'm getting messages all the time from people who are like, I'm a secret ex-Muslim in Egypt and I love watching these interviews or I'm a secret ex-Muslim in Saudi Arabia. And, you know, these, I, I, these interviews give me life, you know? So we are with every story that we tell every time we put our stories out into the universe, you know, it, it's just expanding more and more. We are spreading light and goodness and truth out into the world. And I'm, so grateful to you um, for sharing your story here today. And yeah, thank you so much for being so honest with us and, and for, I know it was difficult and I'm, I just want you to know that I'm really proud of you and thank you so much. And, you. and we'll see you at the next one. No gyms though. <laughs> Together we can move mountains. That's right, Sahara. Thank you. Thank you so much. Love and blessings to everyone. Thank and you. as Sarah, as Sahara says, uh, what is it that you say, Sahara? Fuck you all and love Aaliyah, you. Aaliyah, Aaliyah, Aaliyah memorize. Aliyah, go ahead. Aliyah. What do I say, Aliyah? What, what does Sahara say? Can you guys hear me now? Yes. Yes, we can hear. Yes, yes. Sahara says peace and, and humanity and fuck you all. So. <laughs> humanity and fuck you all. I love that. That's awesome. Thank you. Thank you so much. Love it, Sahara. Thank you so much, Sarah. Thank Take you. care, everyone. Thank you. Take See you care. next week. Bye. Thank you. Bye.